Welcome to SickCast, brought to you by Sick Research Institute, illuminating every path. Vaigurjika Khalsa Vaigurjiki Fateh. Welcome to our series commemorating Vaibir Singh and his enchanting story written about Rana Surat Singh. Hosting the series will be myself, Kiranjot Kaur, the associate editor here at Sikri, and Inni Kaur, the creative director at Sikri, as well as the translator of Bhaivir Singh's work. Rana Surat Singh is the tale of an estranged widow, Rani Raj Kaur, who's pining for her late husband. Within the story, Bhaivir Singh takes us all on a journey from the temporal realm of spousal longing into the depths of a mystical relationship with the divine. We become Rani Rajkor by hearing about her intense desire to meet her king or her late husband Rana Surat Singh. Her story begins with Satsang, a community of inspired beings, and so it makes sense for us to begin the podcast series here as well. By Veer Singh's emphasis on community in this story is perhaps a reflection on the value he places on the larger Sikh community and perhaps his need to reinvigorate Sikh paradigms with the same love-filled devotion one experiences in the presence of the satsang. We too are building and living in a community with these podcasts. By the end, we as the audience really hope to identify with Rani Rajkor and begin to realize our own spiritual journeys in this tale. By Veer Singh's artful prose and elegant ability to weave this mystical story is something that might change us forever and maybe even ignite a light so bright that we too transform, just as Rani Rajkor does. Join our journeys as we explore the intricacies of the Rani's transformation from lover to gurmukh or guru-inspired being in this podcast series, a series that we hope will detail our own reflective silences and mind-opening realizations as we immerse ourselves into Bhaivir Singh's world of Sikhi, hope, and resilience. Thank you, everyone, especially our loyal listeners, for joining us today. In our previous podcast, we went through an in-depth understanding of Ishnan. Following that pattern, in this podcast, we'll be speaking about Dhan and what it actually is. There are quite a few floating definitions of what it means to give today. For some, it means charity and being a philanthropist. For others, it might mean taking out 10% of your earnings and donating donating it to the needy. Many traditions have this. In Sikhi, we call it dasband. In Islam, it's called zakat. A lot of this can be considered religious obligation. For me, dhan has come to play out in different ways over the years. You know, it's a funny story. I remember when I was younger, I saw a homeless man outside the restaurant my family and I were dining at. And I really insisted on telling my parents to get him food since I was young and maybe even get him a place to stay. I was pretty adamant. My family was in the hotel business at the time, so we could do that. And we did. And I remember going to sleep that night, pretty feeling pretty quite uh, satisfied with myself. And I didn't expect anything in return. But as I got older, dawn or giving got really complex for me. I realized that a lot of people came to me with their emotional problems And, you know, having gone through a great deal myself, I felt as though it was my duty to help the people that were coming to me. Soon enough, I realized that the only way I could genuinely help others was to help myself as well. And during that process, a lot of people with similar grievances gravitated towards me. And I I feel like we work together to feel better and heal ourselves through our collective experiences. So there was a lot of taking, but also a lot of giving in this interesting mutual way. In Rana Surat Singh, the the Rani is being taught the various stages of Dhan, and what I just described seems to be only the beginning and surface. How hard could giving really be, right? Why would it even need to be complicated? But one thing that has stayed throughout Rani Rajkor's story is this theme, that the physical always transforms into a metaphysical relationship. So regardless if we are talking about Ishnan or Satsang, there will always be a component that takes us beyond what the eyes can see. And I think that this is definitely going to be the case with Don as well. So welcome back, Aniji. Thank you for joining us for yet another session of maybe, you know, super personal questions. Um, But I wanted to pick your brain about this because I really think that there's something here that you can 
tell us and and help us get into? Guru Fateh to our listeners and Guru Fateh, uh, Karan Jodh. Uh, it's good to be back. I don't know whether I can, you know, I'm in a position to tell you about Dan. I mean, you've been very kind. But what I'm sharing really is what is written in the story. Maybe a little bit of it is from a personal experience, but most of it, I would say 90% of it is really what is being revealed in the book. It is Paibir Singh's work. It's his words, and it's through the voice of um, Rani Rajkor. You know, I can understand you were talking about, you know, Don being confusing. It's hard to understand. But what we need to remember is that Don giving philanthropy comes after Ishnan, the cleansing. If the cleansing hasn't taken place at some level, then Don is different. It's difficult to understand in this particular context. So let's go through it together. And, you know, like we went through Ishnan, there are the different phases or the different parts of uh, Dan, which the body does as well. You began with how as a child, you fed and sheltered a person in need. That is the first form of Dan, and it's done by the body. So what you did was actually right. It was natural. It was what we, you know, there's an understanding that this is what we do, help the ones who have less than what we have. So in that context, this is body done. So how does the body perform done? The body performs done by giving food, medicine, water, clothing to those in need, which I feel, uh, I'm sure many of us will agree as a community, we excel in. But then when there is a deeper awareness within us, the body then begins to provide aid to widows and orphans. That's a deeper understanding. But did you know, Kiran, that sweet, kind words flowing from one's mouth are down too? This was new for me. You know, I know um, how important it is to speak with love, to speak kindly, because Guru Amar Das Sahib in Anand Sahib, you know, says that, tells us that, e rasna, you know, you are here to spread kindness, sweetness. But I never thought about it, that how the, these kind words can also be done, but it makes sense because they're healing. What you said when people came to you, you know, with, with their troubles and you were able to share, because I'm sure... Your language was compassionate. Your language was kind. So that was done. So it was quite right what you were saying. Though it, was, it, though it is complex for you, right, you were saying. Next is man, mandadan, mind. Now what happens is these are stages, right? So when the heart, when there is a desire in the heart to, good, to do good deeds, this is now a little different than the body. The body is, but there is a desire really within the heart. And it is that excitement to do the good deed that makes one walk the path of dawn. And dawn happens in that way. When there is a desire in the heart to do that. Right? Next comes buddhi, the intelligence. I know you're wondering what is this now? And the answer to that question is you have raised how, you know, is that how is one able to genuinely know who is needy and who is not? And how do you actually give? So remember this buddhi dan, intellect dan, intelligence dan, comes after manda dan. In this stage, this is a stage where you recognize your power, your entitlement, your privilege, and you recognize your giving power. It is a realization that you have within you. It is, for some, it is humbling. And for some, it is arrogant. And that's that relationship of the cleansing. How much of that cleansing has happened within you, the ishnan that has taken place. Because between arrogance and humility, there's a fine line. When you realize that you are in a position to help, and I use the word help with great caution because who are we to help when we say we help 
we are in a position of being superior. Actually, we serve. When you look at it in that light, service is always done in humility. Helping is done in a bit of arrogance. So when the mind, if in the mind, if in, uh, you know, in your mind there is that element of arrogance comes in, the intelligence, the buddhi, which has done the ishnan, tells the mind, these are the checks within yourself. Don't get inflated after giving dan. Don't seek, don't seek compensation. It is the intelligence that guides the mind, that the buddhi that guides the mind to serve selflessly and without expectation. Because when expectation is left behind, and this is what Pai Singh writes, that when the expectation is left behind, something remarkable takes place within one. And what is that? That is, insight emerges, gurmat emerges. And what happens when that happens? The gurmukhs then share this insight, illuminating the world with their buddhi, with their intelligence, they enlighten others' intellect. Like a lit lamp lights other lamps. Think about it. The ones who have received this insight, who have worked at them, worked within themselves, who have now this, um, this capacity, they are lit within and they light others as well. And why, how do they do that? They share the method of attaining Nam, knowledge, and love of the creator of Ikyunkar Paramatma with the world, however you want to describe the creator for you. This is how the dan of the intelligence happens. So see how in, uh, the Ishnan plays a huge role? I think of Ishnan as a checker, constantly being aware of what is happening within. So when insight, when that insight emerges, then dan becomes part of one's consciousness, one's chit. It happens automatically. But it, these are the stages one goes through. So now dan of the chit, of the consciousness, and of the mind, and intellect, and buddhi, is beyond the dan of the tongue and the body. Can you see that difference? The body and the, uh, the tongue, it is at a different level. At a level when the ishnan has taken place or one becomes more aware, then there is this desire within the mind to do something. Then the intellect gets, okay, it watches, guides the mind, don't get inflated, don't do this. And then it enters that consciousness. And, those, and when it ent enters our consciousness, when you reach, reach that stage of dan entering our chit, we don't recognize dan. We don't recognize dan as ours to give. The people who have reached the stage, they don't consider dan as an obligation. No longer is it, it is the swan, which is a duty. Nor do they keep an account of their good deeds and their consciousness. It just flows from them. It is not a checklist anymore. It is just happening. And after that, it's that last stage of that Atma, the essence, the spirit. You know, rare ones who get rejuvenated in their Atma, who've gone through the Ishnan, and who truly understand that they are spirit and they are Atma, know that nothing is theirs. Wealth, property, children, friends are really not theirs. These relationships are there because of the body and the senses. But they are beyond that. They are spirit. So their dan becomes spontaneous. And it arises, it happens in sahaj, which is, means it's part of their nature. It happens naturally. Sahaj is when it happens naturally. There's nothing, there's no tension within it's like, if you can look at this as an example, it is like a rose that is just emitting its fragrance to all. It's not holding back from anyone. 
that becomes the disposition of those who have reached this, that, this stage. It's the nature of those. And they have attained the stage of Atman Dan. So this is that Dan journey for the seeker who yearns to become a Gurmukh. So like Ishnam, there is this journey of Dan as well. Wow. That's something that I, you know, I, I didn't expect to hear, but it really was what I needed to hear. So thank you so much, Aniji. And, you know, it's true. I, I feel like people do develop a complex. I mean, I've helped you and therefore I owe you something. And I think what I got from that is that, you know, experience is really the winner here. It's not about intellectualism, but the experience that you go through. And, you know, recently I've been reading this book about thinking like an empath, right? And I think that in the book that I got, I got the same kind of idea that you start with lighting your own lamp and then you, you're you graced with the capacity to then, you know, go on and light other people's lamps. And, you know, I really, I'm curious because as much as I'm following, and I'm sure, you know, maybe our listeners have this question as well, you know, can people have this kind of dawn spirit um, as second nature sooner than later? Like, do people ever kind of just develop it outside of this journey? Or is it always kind of like super linear? Um, you know, I obviously like when I was reading Rani Raj core story, it's a, an experience that I had never experienced before. Um, and, you know, it, I just I just wanted to know, like, I don't think I had this real moment where I was like, okay, this is exactly how I need to be in order for Dawn to be second nature for me. So I want to know, like, is it only you develop it in this journey? Or, um, you know, do you like, is it always linear? Or does someone have an inclination to um, an inclination for Dawn before Ishnan? Does it ever happen like that? Or is it only after Ishnan? I don't know. It's a good question. You know, in a blink of an eye, things change. Nothing is linear. Everything is circular. Love is circular. The minute you put it, put anything linear, it becomes rules and regulations. And love is not that. And this, in the beginning, what we had said, is a love path. But what I do know is an, an awareness. And it's a cultivation within, being aware and wanting something. It's not easy because as human beings, our nature is to want to hoard, to want more power, wealth, everything within. The giving nature is a different. So in this context, because when you're walking on the path, and you want to learn, there are some guidelines. So if we look at them as guidelines, it would probably be easier to look at this journey. And then become second nature. You said, how does it become second nature? It's once when you go through parts of Ishnan and parts of Ishnan is really, is making you more empathetic. It's making you more aware that you are not the center of the universe. There is other, there, there is something else as well. You are a speck. You are not this body. You are a part of a much vaster experience. You are a living spark of the creator. So if we look at it in that perspective, that you are a giver because the creator is a giver. So taking, taking is the nature of illusion of Maya. Giving is the nature of the creator. So the closer you are to that understanding that you are a spark of the creator, the more the giving na that giving nature awakens within you. But for those who have not um, taken the plunge or not aware of that Ishnan, they are forever the takers. They don't really know how to give. Their giving is a transaction. 
because in that giving, they expect tenfold in return for their giving. Their desire increases in their giving. They give, but they want a plaque. They want recognition. They want something. So long as there is this wanting, it is not give, it's not done. Remember we had talked earlier that in love, there is no giving. There is no, it's not a transaction. You just give. It is part of it. It flows. And this is that same principle that dan just flows. I know some of us practice dan as duty, right? It's a checklist. Some of us maybe a little bit more think about it as seba. Yet there is something that we will get something for it. You know, there is, rec but very few actually give without any expectation. And the rare ones reach the stage of realization that Sardate Kuchvini hai God, everything is done, you know, and it's happening on its own. And that's how it becomes second nature. But it's the realization that um, I am nothing, that it is just flowing through me, whatever it is, the intellect, the what is flowing from my hands, from what's flowing from my mouth, it is of that highest good and it is happening on its own. And may it continue. Wow, this is, is, is super exciting for me because I feel like I was reading the story and it was doing its magic and now this conversation is also doing its magic because, you know, I came into it thinking, okay, I have some questions about Don and I'm going to share my experiences, but you know, as you've been kind of, um, you know, we're having this mutual conversation, I feel like you were also giving me something right now. And I'm open to receiving it. And it's just, it's really beautiful. Um, and I feel like I am coming from a place of real naivety and vulnerability when I say that, you know, I have seen acts of charity. It's I'm sure other people have as well. I've also probably participated in these acts. But in the story, it's describing something and you and Niji now are telling me something that I had just never expected to hear. And, you know, maybe, you know, after reading books about empaths, that's I, I picked that book up because I knew I was going to read something about that. But when I started reading by Veer Singh's story, I didn't think that this is how deep it was going to get. And it's really, it's really um, working its magic on me. And, you know, I feel like it's a treasure chest. Like, what have we really stumbled on? And even our listeners right now, um, it's just a kajana. It's it's really, it's just unfolding in so many unexpected layers. And um, I'm really sitting in this place right now where I'm like, wow, like, you know, I, I feel so grateful in this moment to just even be learning about this and be able to speak to you about it because it's... It's just such a, I feel like such a once in a lifetime experience to just the your first initial um, kind of like entrance into Bhaivir Singh's world is it's really humbling. And I'm, I, now I have this itch to really read more and learn more about him and how, you know, uh, how he could just create such a story that after so many years and, you know, after numerous types of different conversations it will do its magic in so many different ways each time so that's quite that's quite amazing and so that leads me to you know maybe again this is a naive question but at any point do you ever truly and fully know um what dawn is or do you have to have reached the level and gone through the journey and and kind of sit in that place to know i don't know I think Dan, from, you know, from what I can say is that as long as there is a need for recognition, whether it's big or small, whether it's being honored or being recognized or wanting someone to see how we're doing in the Sangha, it is a performance, right? So as long as there is that recognition, then it's not a giving. And so you that's a check within yourself. How do you, because there's nobody outside to check, right? These checks are within yourself. It's your consciousness. It is your chit. It is your intelligence that is 
will know what is truly happening within you. And that's why you, when you said it's the magic, because really this is an internal journey. This is nobody doing it outside. How will you know uh, what level you have reached? It is when you have looked deep within yourself and are truly honest with yourself. And looking within is, it's not easy. It's a tough, it's tough looking within. But I do know that when there is an awareness that enters one's consciousness, that this body is a gift. It's done by the creator. And there's a thought, so then what is mine? Nothing is mine. So then one begins to operate from a different level of consciousness. One becomes careful with what one takes from this universe. We take what is needed. When I say take, it is also how we treat the resources of this earth, how we are, our actions show that. It's in small ways, it doesn't have to be in big ways. It is, we become very careful with, I remember, we become very careful with how we turn on the tap when washing our dishes. We become very careful of using how much water in the shower because we know there's a water shortage. There's that awareness that I don't need to do so much. There's an awareness that I don't need so much land. There is an awareness I don't need so many things. That, that wanting more, uh, that kind of dissipates. And there's a, and in this, there's also a, a letting go and an acceptance. It's a beautiful, sweet acceptance that whatever is happening is, is happening in hukam. So dan, hukam, ishnan, they all, nam, they all are together as one in a being. It's not something which is separate. They are part of what is the human, the spirit that keeps one going, walking on the path. And at what level anyone is, only they can decide. And that's only after they have looked within themselves and really um, made that decision that there's a change they want to bring in their life and what that means and what they need to do for that. But it's an internal journey. Thank you, Aniji. Um, you know, and I and I totally respect the fact that you say it's an internal journey and everyone is at different stages um, and coming to different understandings at, um, you know, different points in their lives. And, you know, again, with the personal questions, but, you know, I really want to know because, you know, I, I feel like you are um, very far along on the journey, whether or not you want to admit it or not. And um, I I know in the last podcast, you said your mother had kind of noticed a change in you. And now I'm really curious, and I'm sure maybe some of our listeners are as well. You know, how has this st story really just changed you? Like you mentioned a little bit about uh, maybe becoming environmentally conscious or, you know, more flowing with the way of the universe. So I just want to know, like, you know, what's been your experience um, up until now and and working with these translations? Oh, how has the story changed me? I actually no longer have any excuse. It's one thing when you say you didn't know, right? You don't know, you're stumbling. It is when I, when I had read the line Gurmukh Nam Danishnan and said go probably eight years ago I didn't know what Ishnan meant I had a cursory understanding of Dan but now I know so I have no excuse uh, the road map has been laid out things have been broken down for me and now the hardest part is to walk on the path to walk on what I have received 
So am I willing to allow Shabbat to chisel me? So that I may be worthy to experience a bit of the vastness of Dawn? That's a question for me. And that is, um, it's changed me. It, uh, I've become, I would say, and I don't want to use the word cautious. I've become careful um, or maybe much more aware in what, in, in my speech, in my, in my environment, in anything that I do. There is definitely a heightened awareness. And I think for me, the one line which was in this particular story in this was that the rare ones take the ones who are separated towards Nam. That's the biggest done. And that's what I feel Paivir Singh has done for me. He has taken me personally, the one who was separated towards Guru. So I, you know, when you have that tremendous, you feel that tremendous gift that this is what he has done for you. Then there is, um, you operate from a different place. There is a greater, um, if anything, there's a, the, the giving is not no longer giving is like what you had mentioned so many times in this podcast, Kajana, that you've been given this beautiful treasure, treasure it, walk on it. Go on your journey, see what unfolds, do it for yourself. This is how you will grow. Yeah, it has changed me dramatically. And I know it will continue to change me because it has become a part of me. Um, that's absolutely brilliant, um, Iniji. And I'm so thankful that I got to participate in the magic in this exchange today and the magic of Veer Singh's world and, you know, even the innate magic of the Shabbat. And of course, I'm saying magic so much. I'm a Harry Potter fan. So, uh, but that's the only way I can associate. That's the way I can uh, kind of describe it. And there were just some really beautiful exchanges um, between us today. And I, I really hope that our listeners are feeling the same uplifting sentiments because I know I'll be looking at giving in a, a very different way. And I'm so looking forward to our next podcast when we speak about Nam, which is also, you know, an equally important and mystical concept in Sikhin, you know, arguably the most. Um, and so I'm really curious to see the way that our conversation goes. And I, I can really assure our listeners that I have never read or heard anyone speak about Nam the way that it is shared in this incredible story. So really looking forward to that. And I hope everyone joins us. And before I forget, I do want to mention that I will be hosting regular podcasts with NEG. So please feel free to send me your thoughts and maybe the way in which the story is softening you um, and any other feedback you might have as you walk this journey with us. My email is gidanjotkor um, at sikri.org. Thank you, everyone. And Vaikuji Ka Khalsa, Vaikuji Ki Fateh. Thank you, NEG. Thank you, Karen Jyot and Guru Fateh, and thank you to our listeners as well. You were listening to Sick Cast by Sick Research Institute, illuminating every path.